Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well. We have got a very juicy topic for you today. Have you ever watched a presentation or listened to somebody and had that feeling like there's something about this that just feels kind of weird? Or maybe it's like, mm, I, I don't know, something about this feels weird in my gut and I just can't put my finger on it. That's what we're going to talk about today. Ooh, I can feel my voice is a little bit funky. I think it's uh, our wonderful cold weather we're having here. There we go. I'm all set to go. Just making sure I got all the audio. So let's get into it. This is You Be the Behavior Consultant, a live stream I try to do every Monday, even on a fabulous holiday like today. So uh, um, let's celebrate Martin Luther King Day today, everybody. Shout out to Martin Luther King. And this is how it works. I present a topic for discussion. And then I do have some questions to prompt everybody's participation because we love it when people join into the conversation here. And then we're going to recap it all at the end and I, I see we got some folks here oh yay Cynthia's here to join in with us I'm so excited um all right so what we're talking about today from confusion to clarity choosing trust trustworthy sources for animal training and again like I said you may sometimes get that feeling in your gut there's something going on here that you just can't put your finger on that you feel like do I trust this resource or not? There's something about it that makes me kind of question what I'm hearing and you don't know why. And we're going to try and get into that today. Ooh, I feel like this one's such a good topic. So here are the questions I have for you. And again, I hope you all will, um, oh, and Annette is here too. I hope you all will give me your feelings, your experiences. So first of all, any of these questions you can answer at any time. Um, how important is it to you that your information resources are trustworthy and why? Why do we care? Um, and then what makes you trust a resource for information? This one is a little bit more challenging, I think, because um, it feels sort of like, you know, intuitive. But then again, you know, I think it helps for us to really st start to define what are the things that helps us trust resources. And then what are the red flags? What makes you question a resource? When you're taking in information, what are those things that make your gut go a little twisty and go, oh, I don't know if I believe that or not, or maybe I need to do a little bit more research on that information. And how do you evaluate an information resource for its trustworthiness? So that is sort of that next step there. When you get that little gut feeling what do you do next how do you how do you figure out if you're you're going to stick with that resource and keep moving on there so um so these are my questions for you oh and alex says it's very important i only have so much brain capacity i don't want to fill it with nonsense <laughs> I love that. I know. And we're in the age of information overload, aren't we? There are just so many things to um, coming at us all the time. And, uh, and, and it also, um, you know, in some of the stuff that I look at, I, I hear that, you know, we tend to now, partially because we're being trained to do this with all the stuff that's on the internet, you know, look at something for a few seconds and then go, boop, I'm done with that and move on to the next thing. So it's pretty easy to be dismissive of some things as well. So, um, so yeah, we also have to kind of make our decisions pretty quick. So, you know, what are, what do we you know, what are we looking at that's helping us make these decisions, whether we're going to continue on with a resource or not? And um, yeah, so it, it becomes really important. Yeah. And, um, and Cynthia says really important as well. And that it says important because I use it in my work and because I teach other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it has um, impact beyond just you and what you're doing. Well, and of course, impact for you as well in your work, I think. And I think really just to kind of expand upon that, your work and all of our work here is working with animals and so we are impacting the welfare of animals with the information that we intake so i think that's a really critical um, component that we have to consider so and and again as you're saying exponentially because you're teaching other people it has impact on other people yeah so that's those are really good points i think maybe that's a um, a good segue into our our first slide here, sort of the impact of these trust, tru it's going to be hard for me to say this, you guys, I'm so tongue tied, trustworthy resources, I have to slow down why they matter. Trustworthy sources are the bedrock of reliable information and relying on them is crucial for several reasons. And I, I think I want to, one thing I'm going to say before I get into some of the more details here is that there is a lot of information out there 
on this topic. And I think that kind of speaks to how important this is to, to so many people, um, that this has been written about for years and years and years. People have been facing this dilemma for a long time. So obviously accuracy and truth is, is important to all sorts of industries, not just us. Um, so we need accurate and truthful information so that we can make informed decisions, right? So that um, we don't have misinformation. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about that in a minute here, um, which could lead to bad decisions and even harm in our case with animals. And, and not just animals, we'll talk about some other industries where that can um, be a bad thing. Um, and of course, we want our resources um, to be credible and, and, you know, so we're kind of looking at their reputation as well. So we think of them as having sort of established credibility and reputation for, for having good information and, and doing the research and, and looking up information and spreading good information so we think of it as reliable um and uh and so then, then it helps us when we're we're making arguments and forming opinions so that's why hopefully trustworthiness is important there um and um then we think about objectivity and bias so if a source is trustworthy we hope that they're they're being objective and they're not being biased and so that the information they're presenting is is fair and it doesn't have undue influence from personal agendas. And that's a big one that we're going to get into a little bit more as we talk into things that might be red flags for us. So we know that if something is biased, it can skew that information, leading to sort of a distorted perspective and maybe inaccurate conclusions. So that's that's pretty challenging. Uh, and then we hope that there's some verification and source checking. And again, um, you know, this is where we have to be careful about the confirmation bias, right? So if if they're looking, you know, if, if a credible resource has um, citations and references, hopefully they're getting good citations and good references. Hopefully they're current um, to the best of their ability. Or even if they're not current, hopefully they're they're pretty reliable references and um, and they're verifiable um, so those are all important so I saw some more um, comments here uh, and um, and uh, Gail is agreeing with Anetta and oh yeah and, and Andrew says monetary contingencies yeah so that's that comes into the personal agenda thing here and so um, so I think that's a really important one and and not even just monetary but also um, I think reputational stuff um, you know comes in there as well so there are these contingencies that can influence behavior that can impact the trustworthiness of the resource so so we're get it we'll get into that a little bit more in another slide here as well um, so, and there's consequences of this misinformation, right? And we've been talking about that a, a lot. So again, it can, it can make, um, it can lead to these poor decision, decision-making um, consequences in personal matters. It can lead to financial losses. It can lead to health risks. So, you know, if we think about whether it's the medical industry or, you know, financial industries, and then again, um, political situations, you know, I think this kind of stuff is all over our social media and our, in our political climate. And this is, again, where I go back to, we think about animal training procedures where we have sort of this conflict going on in terms of information, which then ultimately impacts animal welfare. But I do want to make a distinction um, about misinformation and disinformation because I think there is a difference. And and I shouldn't say just think. I think, I, you know, it is out there in, in the literature that there is a difference. So I think disinformation is when it's deliberate. And, um, and I think that's where when we were talking about there may be some contingencies that are influencing behavior where someone may deliberately share false information or inaccurate information, whereas there's misinformation where it's just you don't realize it's wrong. And that could be just from not having come into contact with more accurate information. And so I think those are two very different behaviors, sharing disinformation versus sharing misinformation. And, um, and so I think when we talk about a trustworthy resource, yes, somebody could be sharing misinformation just out of lack of in, lack of accuracy in their information. And that's where, of course, you still need to do some good 
you know, investigation. But if somebody is deliberately sharing um, disinformation or, you know, if somebody's sharing disinformation, then we really have a different set of um, challenges to investigate. And so that's going to take a little deeper investigation. Yeah, and uh, Annette says good point. And so, um, so, and that may cause your, you know, if you can make that discrimination when you're doing your investigation, that may put your radar up for some more things to look for, some more red flags to look for that may change your evaluation in terms of that resource, in terms of their trustworthiness, right? So misinformation is one thing, you know, because you can correct that. Someone can say, oh, you know what? I used to share this information. I now know better and I now share this information. But if somebody is digging their heels in and saying, I know this is incorrect, but I'm going to keep sharing this information <laughs> because it benefits me, whether like as Andrew was saying, maybe for financial reasons, then that may, you know, for me, that would be a red flag that I, that I, you know, hold on to and I say, okay, you know, I recognize that's happening there and that's going to make me question the trustworthiness of that particular resource. So, um, so some training topics for me, and I'd love to got you guys, you know, share your observations as well. I think some topics, topics in which this is kind of relevant right now is, um, you know, we have some folks in our community that are talking about the constructional approach. I think we've got some really fantastic experts in it who are sharing information. And then I think we've got some folks that are maybe sharing, um, I would say misinformation. I don't know if it's disinformation. I think it's more misinformation. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and then I think with negative reinforcement, I think we do have a combination of disinformation and misinformation being shared on that. Um, I think with um, counter conditioning and systematic desensitization, I think we're seeing a lot of misinformation going out on, on that. Nonlinear contingency analysis, I think we're seeing both. Um, degrees of freedom, I think it's, it's just, well, I, I would say I have observed both. <laughs> Um, and uh, coercive positive reinforcement, I think that's still coming along. So maybe it's it's some misinformation. You know, and of course, again, we do have the people that, that know their stuff and are sharing the good information on all this stuff out there. Um, Ascent is coming along. So I think that's um, uh, kind of new information. So maybe we just have some misinformation still going on out there. Genuine choice and interpretations of control. I think that's still kind of new in terms of the information that um you know is coming along uh although i will say there's still some disinformation um being shared there too as well as misinformation i think there's there's just a, a lot so i think these particular topics i think i would be really careful with the the source um and the information that you're you're looking at i think you it's it's to your benefit to really investigate what information is being shared with you so you're making sure that you're getting accurate information um i just hear a lot of different people saying a lot of things and i think even for me in my growth on learning some of these things in the past i shared misinformation and now i'm becoming more accurate in the information that i'm sharing i don't think i was intentionally trying to share incorrect information as just as i get better i learn more but i do think there are some folks that are sharing disinformation on some of these topics to to persuade you to not use some of these things because they are they they don't want you to go down those pathways. So um, so I I would be really careful about that um, when you hear people talking about these topics and try to go to sources that you feel are providing accurate information, um, just so that you know you can make your own judgments on it whether it's for you or not for you. It's up it's up to you. I'm not going to tell you that you have to do one thing or another, but but you know use your critical thinking skills so that you can make a decision that's appropriate for you and and what you're doing with your animals. So um, moving forward, and again, you are welcome to comment at any time. Um, so let's talk about some tactics that can influence our trust, so to speak, in um, a source of information. And these can be, I think, used in good ways and bad ways. So I'm just going to put them out there. This is where you kind of have to combine um, them with some critical thinking skills, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so appearance, and these, and again, these are all things that come from um, some resources and references that I, I will provide for you in animaltrainingfundamentals.com, but, but um, the appearance, so, so how that person visually, their visual stimuli, how they look to you can influence 
our our feelings of trust towards them for lack of a better a better um, description so um, so we can be influenced by quote a uniform but and I'm saying uniform in the sense that maybe it's an image that's cultivated to portray something so maybe it's um, portraying a an image that works for your community if that makes sense or your your you know what you know whether it's like say it's academic or let's say you know for my field you know maybe if it was looking more like I get down and dirty with animals you know that 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 you know is going to be more receptive to my audience or maybe if I wore glasses I would you know look a little bit smarter to you or maybe if I wore um wore, wore these you know I'd look like you know I'm I'm a rock and roller. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever works for that community, right? So, so if you portray an image that makes you more um, uh, accepted by that particular community, that can that can uh, have influence. Maybe you know, you know, being good looking um, works better for that audience. All those things can influence the rece receptivity of that that person. Oh, here we go. Having a large following on social media can definitely in influence people to believe they are a trustworthy resource, but it's important to know a trainer's background, experience, and value. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, and, you know, and again, in, um, you know, some of the in information out there about marketing, there's a lot of information about how to build a following that even suggests you don't need to be an expert, just, you know, here's all the tactics to build a following and, and you will be perceived as an expert. So that's a really good point. Uh, communication, you know, so we all, and again, we also see this, you know, being a, a good presenter or a good speaker can, can lure someone in. Superficial charm, you know, we know, we know that one uh, um, quite well from the information on, um, uh, well, and I hate even using the word, but narcissism, because it's, you know, that's overused these days. Um, but being really entertaining and funny. Um, tattoos used to be perceived as making people untrustworthy. Yeah, well, you know, you know I'm not showing mine today because it's cold here, but, you know, I got lots of tattoos. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, but the culture has made a shift on that now, haven't they? You know, tattoos have a, have a different, um, have a different, uh, you know, meaning I guess now you know certainly in the animal training world a lot of people um, have uh, animal tattoos so so that could be to our benefit now in a different culture um, that may may still be looked down upon and then authoritative you know having that sort of authoritative posture um, can influence behavior and so you know the classic one that people talk about is the Milgram experiments where you know somebody dressed in a lab coat telling someone else that they have to give somebody a shock for giving the wrong answer even though the shock is um, is not actually being administered and the other person is crying out like they're in pain receiving the shock and the test was really on the person giving the shock to see how much shock they would give the other person because an authoritative figure was telling them to do it um, so that's you know that we we can see that an authoritative figure can influence behavior and then um and then, you know, kind of tying in with that is this idea that, you know, they've published something, um, even if it's self-published or just something like you know, something that's posted online or otherwise uh, can can, you know, give that perception of authority. Uh, so um, so again, you know, you might have to evaluate that. But again, you know, using our critical thinking skills, even published content um even if it is peer reviewed, we still want to review those with a critical eye um, and not just automatically go, oh, well, it's published. Therefore, that means, you know, automatic, automatically trustworthy kind of stuff. So some more tactics that can influence our, our trust is um, persuasive language. And, um, and I have another live stream that goes into more details about what that is. So I'm not going to dive too far on this on, on this one, but um, and I'll, I'll tell you all about that at the end there um and then they're so nice to you <laughs> super friendly pretend to be interested really you know seem really helpful and like um and this this one uh I I, I guess I have a little bit more on this in another side too but but you know really super complimentary lots of flattery you know it's like they always have something nice to say about your appearance or you know but but it but again, it's not like there's anything wrong with giving people compliments, but it's this thing. For me, they stand out when they're disingenuine. And I think we talked about this in the feedback um, 
live stream as well. You know, to me, they, they, they kind of stand out, you know. <laughs> and again, it, that's why I was saying all these you kind of have to take with a grain of salt because some of these are, you know, could be just genuine good things. But there's that, like I was saying, there's that gut feeling when you're kind of like, mm, there's something about that that just is, feels weird. Um, maybe they mirror your attire. Um, again, you know, sort of. Uh, and maybe mirror your facial expressions. Um, and, and again, very friendly, very attentive. Um, you may know them, they may be familiar to you, maybe you've met them in person and that could influence your trust. You feel like you feel like you know them. Um, here's another one that I, I tend to notice a lot. It's just one of those ones that is a stimulus that jumps out at me um, when I'm, especially when I listen to um, podcasts and things like that. Uh, and, and I, for lack of a better term, I just call it name dropping um, because I'll notice when someone seems to f be compelled to mention all the people they're connected to or, in, or, or like big name institutions or big name organizations. Now I get that, you know, we all put in our resumes, you know, I've, I've done this, I've done that, whatever. But when it's, when it's repeatedly somehow this person knows everyone or I did something with this person or I did something with that person or I, I you know I'm, I'm always you know they're always somehow they somehow seem to know everybody um, it always stands out to me it's like why are they mentioning those people um, because I, I I think you know like um and I and I'm not gonna mention the name here but um, someone that a few of us know who is really well respected in the industry um, I'm always shocked at the people he knows that are really, really like famous, so to speak, and he never mentions their names. And then when I find out he does know them, I'm always like, whoa, how does he know that person? But he never mentions their names because he doesn't need to. <laughs> and, um, and so it's always a surprise to me that he's connected to some really influential people, but he just never, he just never mentions that, you know, it's just not important to him. Um, and so I always, I, so to me, the name dropping thing always just like, is a is a thing that jumps out at me uh okay um oh here's another one some trainers will also suggest they are the only tr trustworthy resource and the only only they have the answer but there is also there is often a financial reason um, and you can get the info from multiple resources yeah for sure yeah and i often um uh, oh, okay. And Ruth says, and you know this, of course, but just reminding that name dropping is not the same as citing resources. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, I do, I do think it's important to make reference to the people that um, influence you or, um, or that you've learned from. Yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, I guess what I was thinking, it's more like, you know, I hang out with this person or I was having lunch with so-and-so or, you know, the other day we had a phone call. You know, like you don't need to mention that, right? I mean, is it really necessary? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. <laughs> Maybe I'm being sensitive to it. But it's one of those things that stands out to me. I think more so because, like I said, I've noticed that um, other people who could do the same thing don't that I really admire. Uh, and Ruth says, yes, I definitely know what you meant by name dropping. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. And the multiple resources. Yeah. And I guess um, I guess I think of like the multiple resources. I sort of think of it like, um, you know, because I'm a big uh, as you I, I think many people know here. I I'm a huge music person. I love uh, music and which is why. You know, I live where I do because I can see lots. I especially love live music. And so I I can go see lots of lots of bands. And so, you know, and so I do <laughs> and I go see lots of live music. I'm not committed to only seeing one band. Over, you know, well, I do see a lot of the same bands over and over again, but I can also see many bands. And the cool thing about, you know, where I live is everybody supports all these different bands. You know, you know they they go see each other and they go support each other. Um, and I think that's kind of the cool thing is you can, you know, you can like lots of different resources you are lots of different bands so to speak so you can also like lots of different resources that you know one person isn't the only person to teach you how to target train an animal right <laughs> um and you know we all have differences and nuances but um you know it's kind of like um you know different versions of different and different categories you know and you know like i don't really specialize in dog training like alex is just talking about um about dog training here you know and and i wouldn't you know really step into that world so 
I'm happy to refer people to other people that are better at, at that than I am. Uh, let's see. In the dog training world, I often see trainers use their experience with animals in childhood to add to their credibility. Uh, I've worked with the animals for 30 years and they're 40 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But you're, or I had, a, I had a dog when I was a kid, so therefore. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, so it does. It takes investigation. I think that's a really good point. And um and, uh, and so that's one of the things that I, I try to do sometimes when I, you know, when I look at a bio or, you know, I hear about somebody's credentials when they say they've been doing it for 25 years. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I've been in the business for 25 years. I don't remember you at a, at a zoo 25 years ago or your name in the zoo industry or at the conference or whatever, you know. So, so you know, but, but you know, and someone who's new may not may not be thinking about those things or or looking at those things so those it's great that you guys think about about that stuff um but but again that's why you know it's good to have have that critical thinking skills in place to start evaluating those kinds of things so that you can ask yourself okay is this person being forthright are they being upfront with you know what they're telling me and should i trust that as a resource if they're not willing to be upfront about you know, their background, so to speak. Um, okay, so some other tactics, but keep coming with these. I think you guys are coming up with some really good points here in your comments. Um, they may feign vulnerability and shared experiences. So, you know, it could be that, oh, you know, and the one that came up to me just, you know, I mean, some easy ones are, are like, you know, oh, you know, we've all had animals that have, that we've been very close to that have died or, or something, you know, we could, that would be an easy one to latch on to or, or maybe um, a behavior problem that we've all experienced and felt the, the pain of that, you know, you can, you can latch on to those things and, and, you know, I've gone through that too, or, you know, and you can think of lots of different things or trying to nurse a sick animal, all those things could be things that you could latch on to as a shared experience. Um, repeated doctrines, catchphrases, and group speak. We went over this in the um, live stream about, about cults, but, uh, but yeah, that can be a, a very bonding thing, right? You know, if we all kind of use the same lingo and we limit it to this lingo, and that's where controlling information and access also comes in there, that can become very influential. So, you know, like we push out all other information and we only speak our own lingo, that can be very persuasive. All right, um, some more things. Leverage, um, projecting or portraying competence, even if you don't have it, <laughs> or that expert level knowledge. And, um, and so I think this also ties in with some of the comments that you guys um, uh, are, are sharing here. And so I, I see this a lot where um, I'll see uh, presentations where it, the person doesn't really have any um, content, if that makes sense. So it's sort of like borrowing content from other folks, you know, like I'll use, um, so like they don't miss necessarily train the animals, so they use videos from other people or, um, uh, you know, or make requests online, you know, can I have a, a video of, you know, you know, I get these requests all the time and I don't give my videos away except for like, like I may collaborate with somebody really, really close and trusted, um, but generally I don't share videos of my work in, for other people's presentations. But um, when other people are asking for videos for their presentations and, and they were relying primarily on videos of other people's work, that, that's always a red flag for me. I'm like, well, why don't you have your own videos of you training animals <laughs> um, for your presentation? Um, so you may... Um, you may pay for their time, you know, and, you, and we do see sometimes where people charge outrageous fees. Uh, this may be, like, I think of this more sometimes in these other communities that are like, you know, learn how to, you know, conquer the internet for, you know, pay me a thousand dollars for an hour of my time and I'll show you how to conquer the internet or something like that. You know, and that, that sort of automatically makes you think, oh, well, they must be an expert because they're so, so, so expensive. <laughs> um, Let's see what else. Um, and I think this one was mentioned already about, you know, they're just famous, you know, they're just high profile on the internet or their name gets mentioned a lot. And so therefore it's social validity. But again, um, that can just be a great internet strategy, a great marketing strategy. And, um, and that does not necessarily mean good quality content or, or that they are trustworthy. So, you know, you just have to be really careful with that. 
Another strategy um, that can't, you know, this was also mentioned in the literature that um, sort of gift giving or services for free can lead to expectations of re reciprocity. I can never say that word. <laughs> you should give them something back in return or there's some sort of pressure there. And so we have seen this in the animal training industry where it's like, you know, hey, you know, I'll, I'll do this little thing for you for free. I'll, I'll come consult for a few days or I'll, I'll give you a free lecture or um, you can use my place for free. And that sort of gives some leverage there. Um, in some pl in some situations, that can turn into conflicts of interest if if um, you know depending on the circumstance. So that has to be you know looked at as well. Um, body language you can build rapport through mimicking mannerisms and speech patterns. Again, you know we're using some behavior things there that can influence stuff. Again, facial facial expressions, deep eye contact, warm smile, leaning in, nodding. This is here's one that I keep an eye out for because I'm sensitive to it. When somebody, you know, I am somebody who, if I'm going to have physical contact with somebody, for me personally, um, it's kind of a big deal. It means that I really want to hug you or I really want to touch you. When somebody puts a hand on me, you know, I'm like, why are you doing that? <laughs> what's what's the strategy there and I have seen this one used frequently where it's like they reach out and they touch the arm here and they look closely at the person and they say like some compliment and they look very intense and I'm just like oh that looks so manipulative <laughs> that one really bothers me <laughs> so I'm very aware of that one um I don't like it when and I'll just be honest, I don't like it if somebody does it to me. So if you ever think about, you know, you meet me in person, don't do that one to me. <laughs> I'll be thinking what are you up to. Um, okay, Alex says in the dog training world, I often see trainers use their experience. Oh, no, I read that one. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I read that one already. Being emotional, touching is a known strategy, says Aneta. Yeah, yeah. I guess we've all been there on that one. Um, yeah, I just, for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's one that I definitely kind of go, oh, it, red flag I definitely I think I stiffen up you know unless unless it's like you know like a genuine warm hug from someone I know or I have history with um you know I I definitely am like what's up what's going on here <laughs> uh oh to get sympathy Annetta says it's like to get sympathy yeah um and then another thing that you know some people default to is well they never did anything bad to you so it must be okay you know where, where if somebody's saying to you well I don't trust that person or I'm, I'm not sure you know you may not have had a bad experience so you don't necessarily have a reason not to trust <laughs> so um so those are some of the things to consider um and now I kind of wanted to look at the flip side of of what you know, might make someone trustworthy? What what might that look like? Now, and again, you know, all of these, there's overlap and we kind of have to, you know, take things with a grain of salt. We're always looking, you know, at the specific conditions and, you know, there's so many factors to consider, but, um, but we'll, we'll look a, a little bit more at, you know, our critical thinking skills here um, in a bit too. So we might look for, um, consistency when we're thinking about what trustworthy might look like um you know their behavior and their words do their actions align with their words do they follow through on their commitments and promises maybe some inconsistencies might raise some red flags about you know are they really sincere about what they what they say and what they do um and then again i know value is a sort of you know it's a little what are what are values um but, you know, if, I think, you know, for us, when we think about animal training, there are things that we we might break down into, um, you know, we could we could categorize them as values. Like we have some certain things that we when we look at a procedure, we, we look at, you know, is is it um, is it effective? Is it efficient? Is it optimal? I mean, those are words that we came you know, that we kind of pull from behavior analysis. We although we, you know, in, in, in my little community, we chose optimal instead of. Um, words like least restrictive um, because I think it better describes what we're trying to do which is to minimize harms and maximize benefits is how we defined optimal and I would say those are kind of the values that that um, I tend to go by and so when we're talking about behavioral procedures and um, are, are we trying to follow 
those guidelines when we are implementing procedures and developing procedures. And so those are those are what, you know, we're trying to stick by. And so are the things that we talk about and the actions that that we do, the the practical applications, do they reflect that? Um, and and so and then I think another part of this is which we referred to earlier is when we're faced with a tough decision, do we choose integrity and fairness over personal gain? And and um and that's you know that's where you know we're talking about like conflicts of interests and um you know having to make those decisions that aren't always going to be about how does this benefit the person you know and so sometimes that means changing your position on something that you may have always supported in the past you know like for me I think a critical thing that happened in my career is having contact at you know especially at the art and science of animal training you know learning from the people that that I often mention you know learning from Joe Lang and Paul Andronis and Jesus Rosales Ruiz at that conference really changed my direction in animal training and caused me to start learning more about some different information that I didn't have before. This is where I was saying, I, for me, I felt that I had misinformation and now my tra- tra- trajectory has changed. And so that has caused me to change the things that I was teaching in the past and say, you know what, I don't teach that stuff anymore. I teach this information now. And, um, and you know, that's just, for me, the right choice based on learning new information that's new information to me and may and you know and I'm you know and for me I think um one of the things that I've been hearing is that well it's it's really old information but I think I I heard this recently in something that I was listening to that I thought was really valuable somebody said that um well everything is just old information (laughs) but the reality is is that old information is new to somebody. <laughs> it's, it's, it's new to somebody. It's always new to somebody who hasn't heard it before. And so that makes, to me, that makes it valuable. And even though, you know, and, and, and in my opinion, you know, Gold Diamond's paper is now 50 years old. That's not that old. And the reality is there's a whole bunch of people that don't have that information who haven't learned how to apply that information, especially in the animal training community. And um, and so for a lot, a lot of people, this is gonna be new information. I'm, and even for me, I'm still evolving on how I'm learning to apply it and use it to help animals. And I think it is quite different from what I learned in years prior. So we have, I think, the potential for a lot of growth by embracing this information that is new to our community and new to a lot of people. So, um, so I think there is value in saying we need to embrace this information and move forward and see where we can go with it so that we can improve animal welfare. So we have some comments here. Um, Gus says, so true. And, um, and Annetta said, old information can also be interpreted in different ways. Oh yeah, that's a really good point. Absolutely. I think I think we're especially seeing that about the negative reinforcement information. I think, um, you know, especially as, as far as how the animal training, well, not just animal training community, I think Andrew can attest that even the, the human community um, is interpreting negative reinforcement differently now, too. I mean, it's it has been very consistently rejected in the animal training community. And, um, and it and we are now doing so much better at understanding that how a learning process is used in a procedure can vary dramatically depending on how it is applied in that procedure. And I think that's a really important concept to embrace, which I don't feel like I understood 20 years ago. I think I understand it a lot better now. And yeah, so how we apply it in practice is very different. Yeah, is what Annette is saying with with and with different animals. And so I think we are becoming better and better and better at fine tuning our our application of negative reinforcement under different conditions with different animals in a way that improves animal welfare because of these conversations we're having. So um, so I think this is where we need to let go of you know 
this notion that, you know, we got to got to stick to the old ways or whatever, you know, we, it's okay to evolve. It's okay to, to evolve, you know, and say, Hey, I just didn't know. <laughs> and that new, and, you know, and, and considering, you know, and, and just saying, Oh, well, you know, that's just old. I, well, well, I don't know it, you know, I don't care how old it is. It's, it's, it's new to me. It's new to other people and it's, and it's helping people and helping animals. So, so, you know, I, I'm not hanging on to, to the new old argument. <laughs> Uh, and in tons of different, re yeah, it's in lots of different situations is what, uh, what Annette is saying. So, um, so some more things, um, transparency and authenticity. So openness and honesty, honesty. So, um, so this also is, you know, are, you know, is the source, um, open to sharing information, even the potentially negative details. So, you know, and I guess, you know, I'd say every single one of us here probably has some um, history that we're not, you know, we, we're not proud of for whatever reason, you know, and, and are we okay to share those, those mistakes, um, those things that brought us to where we are now. And uh, I, I have a feeling I've shared a few of those stories over these live streams, things that, you know, that I've learned along the way that were, you know, me learning that you know this is this is the not the way to do it and this is a better way to do it um do they avoid exagger exaggeration or deception yeah so you know we don't have to cover up our, our mistakes we can learn from them uh and you know i think hillary's done some great presentations about that too about um sharing mistakes and how we can learn from that and um yeah i mean none of us are perfect right i mean you know we've all had you know animal training's a process it's not you know and uh, and I think that's one of the things I appreciate about um, uh, um, Ogden Lindsley. You know, I mean, when you look at precision teaching, you you know, you are looking at you know your growth, right? As you become more fluent, you look at how you're you are making less errors. So every one of those errors teaches you something. And you know, I know we talk a lot about errorless learning, so we avoid frustration and things like that, but those errors do teach us something. <laughs> All right, authentic authenticity. Do they walk their talk? Do they present themselves authenticity? I can't talk authentically without trying to project project an artificial image. So basically do your private and your public align. So, you know, is what we're seeing what we're getting um, or is, you know, what's happening behind the scenes a little different than what you're actually talking about in front of the audience. And um, and that's a little tougher to discern if you don't actually know what's going on behind the scenes. So that might take some investigation. And um, and, you know, so for this for the person who's maybe just ingesting content on the surface they may not be able to discover that that might take some you know exploration and discussions with more people to find find out those truths uh, Netta has another comment um, if you've trained a lot and haven't made any mistakes you're lying <laughs> I think that's true yeah <laughs> yep I I would have to agree with that too all right um all right, uh, so what trustworthy looks like. I love this picture of this cat. I know it's very, you know, anthropomorphic, but I love it. <laughs> All right, competence and capability, skills and expertise. Do they possess the necessary skills and knowledge to handle a situation? Do they demonstrate competency? Um, so again, I think this kind of ties in with what I was saying earlier about, you know, they may project an image of competency, but do they actually do the work? Do they, can they do it? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so that's one of those ones where, again, you might have to investigate, does the person actually do what they say they do? Can, can they, you know, can they train animals? Um, or are they just saying that they train animals? That's, that would be um, a thing to explore, you know, and, and, uh, and sometimes if you're new to the field, that may be hard to discern, you know, you may be looking at some, you know, clips on social media that look really fascinating and, you know, mind blowing, but, um, you know, it may be hard to tell, like, if this person knows what they're doing or not. But, um, but again, you know, if they're using other people's videos all the time, that should be a red flag to you. Um, or at least it is to me. Um, reliability and responsibility. Can they be counted on? Um, uh, and do they take re responsibility for their actions and mistakes? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, um, that's one of the things I, I uh, laugh at in my own videos where I, like, if I mess up somebody's great training session, I have it on camera where I'm saying, oh, I just ruined your training session. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have to be able to do that. So empathy and care, um, which reminds me, 
I, that of uh, the great paper, which I guess really is, the word is compassion, um, that is out there by um, Jesus and uh, um, Cameron right now. I should I should link that one in the um, in the uh, um, re- references. Uh, active listening and understanding. Do they actively listen and demonstrate a genuine interest in others' perspe- perspectives, emotions, emotional behavior, and related emotions? And again, like I said, that kind of this is where it overlaps a little bit with the other stuff because the other one I was saying how you know, you know, having someone look really interested can make you trust them, but it's like how do you tell between genuine and disingenuine? You know, that can be tough. Um, support and kindness. Do they offer help and support um, within the level of their competency, of course? And they do they treat others with respect and care without um, there being some sort of expectation attached? You know, that's that's the thing that we're trying to look out for there. Um, clear and respectful communication. Um, do they communicate clearly and concisely, avoiding ambiguity or manipulation? Again, that's where we have to think about what's the difference between persuasive language, um, exploited, uh, um, uh, exaggeration, all those things. That so that's that other live stream that I didn't. You know, that's that's about dissemination, um, where it goes into more detail about how language can be very manipulative. Uh, and do they treat each other uh, with respect, even in disagreements? And um, proactive communication, do they seek proactive solution-based communications and approach challenges constructively? I think we have to do this a lot as animal trainers because we, you know, we are often seeking solutions to behavior problems. And so we always are kind of on a solution-based approach to everything, at least I feel like we often are. Um, and, and this ties in receptive, this ties into our feedback uh, um, live stream, are they open to feedback and change? That's a big one, especially when new information supports altering their behaviors to improve conditions. So if we see people digging their heels and going, nope, 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 I don't, I don't want to hear about the new stuff. Let's just keep doing it the way we've always been doing it. I think we're seeing that still quite a bit right now when we're talking about counter conditioning and systematic desensitization. People are having a hard time with that one. Now, again, that may be just more about misinformation than disinformation, um, but we are still seeing a big resistance to that um, as well as a big resistance to the negative reinforcement information that um, is coming out now again like I said that may not be someone trying to be deliberate but um, but more just about having yet to come into contact with information that can that can help them so let's I can't believe how much time has passed already I've been talking a lot sorry guys but I appreciate you all giving your input here so let's now talk about critical thinking um, and how we can use that to help us maybe make the discrimination between trustworthy and maybe trying to manipulate us a little bit so I think some things to look out for are urgency and pressure is there sort of this pressure to make you you know, yeah, you got to go, you got to come this direction, you know, you have to go this way. Um, And especially if it's like right now, you know, make the decision now, you have to, you have to follow this stream and reject that stream. Um, Are they trying to isolate you from other sources of information? Again, that's controlling what other resources might influence your, your um, decision making process. And again, there could be that emotional manipulation. So are they playing upon your fears, your insecurities, or your desires to gain leverage? Like, like your, you know, your animal is going to suffer. Your animals, you know, um, you know, your animals having poor emotional welfare because, you know, you're not doing this. Or, you know, I think that would be the kind of thing that people would tend to play upon with animal trainers, you know, because we love our animals so much. It's like, you know, you're not being ethical. You're causing your animal to suffer if you don't do this. You must do it this way. You know, that can be a really persuasive argument for people working with animals. Ah, and then this one, (laughs) analyze that communication. Um, Are they specific and clear? Do they give you specific details and evidence to support their claims? If they're being a little bit vague, that would be suspicious. But then this is the other one that's really challenging um, to evaluate, but confirmation bias. This can heavily influence the information. So are there resources from a limited pool? Like I, there's one that keeps popping up for me where they just keep using this one single reference to support their argument. And you know, one reference for me 
pretty not not so great and um and that particular reference is a different um, interpretation compared to all the other references out there for what the argument that they're trying to support so it's very cherry-picked <laughs> do they frequently self-reference um, so you know those kinds of things stand out for me and and you know if you can get in the habit of looking for those kinds of things that'll do you um, good in the long run do they appeal to authority so do, do they um, again rely heavily on citing um, respected figures or institutions without allowing critical examination. So you might have to verify that information independently. And then this one, I just saw this the other day, flattery and charm. So is there this excessive flattery or compliments that feel insincere or manipulative? Um, so they shouldn't have to do that. And so I, it, it, there was a um, social media post where somebody was vulnerable they revealed a mistake that they made on social media in a group and and this person like overdid it on the flattery and and you and I, for me i just went what are they up to <laughs> i was just like oh this is this is strategic and i'm not sure what they're up to but it really looks strategic so you know that kind of stuff stands out to me um and maybe i'm being hypersensitive but those are the kinds of things that that i look for i can't help but but you know look for those these days um again exaggeration or hyper, hyper hyperbole hyperbole sorry Oh my goodness. Um, do they exaggerate or make fantastical claims like this is the cure all? This is the this is the only way. This is the thing that will, you know, get you to incredible animal welfare. You know, you need to um, look out for things like that. Uh, and again, who benefits? Who stands to gain if you believe their claims or take their desired action? Self-serving motives can be the red flag. You know, if this is, you know, if this is really attached to a person or a brand, um, that might be something that you may want to investigate more. You know, why must you go down this pathway? Um, and um, or is it just sort of, you know, kind of like it's out there, it's common knowledge, um, it's, you know, this is just their interpretation of it. That may be, you know, a different thing that you may feel like, okay, well, they're just giving their twist on it um, or helping me apply it in this environment. Uh, that may you may feel more more comfortable about that versus you know uh, you know it's it's branded so to speak. Um, is it too good to be true? <laughs> Does it seem like it fixes all your problem pro problems and it over promises and what it can deliver? And then I think this is a really great thing to pay attention to your gut feeling. Is there just something about it that feels a little weird? You know, is it a little untrustworthy somehow? And probably what's happening is something that you heard today is 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 some stimulus condition that you're experiencing is coming up that you heard today. And that's what's causing you to go, I don't know what's what's going on here. You know, they they touched me and that was weird. Why would she do why would they do that? They um they cried during their presentation. Why are they crying? That doesn't seem like something you would cry about. Are they trying to manipulate my emotions? Um, why are they digging their heels in on this particular content? I've heard this, you know, over here that makes more sense. So why are they rejecting that argument? All those things may be coming up for you, but you just don't know how to articulate it. But there's something inside you that's responding to that stimulus that makes you feel a certain way. So the stimulus conditions and the outcomes they're producing are creating a feeling for you, right? The contingencies, right? Was we've learned about this from Gold Diamond, right? Emotions as contingency descriptors. So, so this is what could be going on there that's giving you this gut feeling. And if you do a little bit more explanation, you may be able to identify the specific contingency, the specific conditions um, and outcomes and what that behavior is that's going on there that's, that's giving you this um, feeling and then that'll that'll help you do a little bit more investigation so that you can say ah okay I know what's bothering me here and that's making me question this is a trustworthy resource so there you go you have to research and verify your information then just don't blindly accept the claims independently research and verify the information provided you might seek some second opinions so maybe you talk to some of your trusted friends colleagues mentors or advisors to gain different perspectives I definitely do this I mean I have conversations where I take deep dives on things that I've heard with people that I really trust 
and we we bounce it back and forth and we go okay well what do you think about that you know why would they say that is is this about you know personal gain is this a strategic move is this valid information is this stuff that i could take and use and maybe improve my animal training so i have those conversations for sure and again trust your instincts if it feels off or manipulative it's okay to disengage and say you know what maybe that's not for me and that's okay so now look, i can't believe we are already at the top of the hour i did a lot of talking guys <laughs> all right <clears throat> So I'm going to kind of recap what we talked about here. So relying on trust, trustworthy resources or sources for information is essential. It promotes accuracy, credibility, and objectivity and allows for informed decision making, ultimately protecting us from the consequences of misinformation or disinformation and poor judgment. There are numerous deceptive tactics we need to watch out for, including appearance and communication, persuasion and leverage, authority and fake expertise, emotional manipulation, and confirmation bias. Recognizing whether someone is genuinely trustworthy or employing deceptive tactics requires a keen eye and critical thinking. We can examine consistency and values, transparency and authenticity, competence and reliability, empathy and care, proactive communication and openness. Be wary of individuals who attempt to create instant trust through, through superficial charm or manipulative tactics. Do your research, verify information independently, seek second opinions, and trust your instincts. Remember, building trust takes time and genuine effort. By taking a cautious and critical approach, you can protect yourself from deception and cultivate genuine trustworthy relationships. Um, and let's see here. I, I did mention there's some resources. So some of the things that we talked about in here are also in um, our Addressing Resistant to Change. They're also in our uh, live stream that was on as animal training influenced by confirmation bias. We also talked about deception in the animal training kingdom. And we talked about uh, cult-like groups and if animal training produces cult-like groups. And then we also had dissemination practices of animal training information and also how propaganda can impact the animal training community. So we've got lots of resources that are tied to this topic that I think you guys would really enjoy. And then I also want to remind you that we've got a special GOATS coming up, Global, Global Online Animal Training Series. This one is called Freeing Crabs from the Bucket, Reaching Our Potential by Recognizing Others. That one's going to be on February 5th. This one is free to anybody that wants to attend, although members can get a badge for attending. And even better, I've made a 25-page 25 25 page graphically designed download uh, downloadable PDF that supports this particular course. And it's really all about um, the importance of giving attribution and how it helps our industry and I'm very excited about it it's all ready to go so I hope you guys are going to join I also want to remind you about our pretty cool uh, animal training credentialing program which is ex is very extensive I have to say and rigorous and engaging and it includes practical application behavior science program development problem solving lots of real life examples with many different species from around the world from my on-site consulting and you get verifiable badges for all the content you study you know for each course and of course the entire curriculum so it, you really get to show all the details of how much you studied how much you invested in your professional development so it's it's much more than a certificate and because it's digital you can share everything really easy for CEUs for C CVs with your supervisors on websites on social media and it's an awesome deal that is included in your membership and I do hope you will join which um, we've got some several options one is a monthly option um, the, the annual is a better deal you get a big savings and then of course we do have a facility option so if you um, work at a facility you get up to 200 sub accounts for a very good price and here is the citation for this week's live stream if you enjoyed it and want to share it and there you go look at that just at 12 o'clock and Annetta has a comment uh she likes the recap make sure you like what you like it may pay, impact others thank you for a great Monday deep dive yes we went way deep so I know that one was a lot more talking than usual not, not as many videos well no videos sorry guys um 
But as you can see, we filled that whole hour there. Um, I hope you find that information useful and, you know, it kind of broke down all those little intricate things that, that you might be looking at to help you evaluate resources. And maybe a few examples of some of the things that I observe that, you know, catch my eye and ear and cause me to take a step and, you know, look at things when I'm when I'm evaluating resources, because I'm constantly listening and reading and uh, taking in information and trying to grow and learn as well. So, you know, it you know, I'm always I'm always paying attention to stuff, too. So I hope you guys are as well. And um, and I hope it helps you as you make your decisions. And I guess that will conclude our Monday. Oh, and uh, and Cynthia says important stuff. Thank you. And I appreciate you all being here. And um, I do believe we will be here next Monday as well. So I look forward to joining you again. And we'll have another topic to explore. So thank you so much for being here. And we'll see you again next week. Take care.